I was fortunate enough to, to be here at the beginning, and I'm here at the end of the Local 199. Started in 71 and left in 81, and by then the, the new work was just about gone. Well, here we are, George. Yep. Take one last look here. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears in this place. All right, well, let's go take a look through here. See what we see. What we're shutting down. See, we even have uh, banners still up there. And of course, this is our old founding fathers here. Of course, Mr. Welcher. He remember yeah, Sonny. Yeah, I remember Sonny. Yeah. Two of all us guys, boilermakers, that was that was on the job. We built two 650 megawatt Foster Wheeler coal fire units on that site. Uh, so this is where we did our training. No training going on here now. No, none going on now. But I do remember the time when it fire was flying in here, ground is going, and people welding and burning. You know, it's a it's a beautiful facility. Yes, sir. I, we were very proud of this facility. Uh, at St. John's River Power Park, we built some new uh, SCRs there. And they do all their work now, non-union. Well, there was a reason for that. Yeah. And you know what, what the reason was. Well, what was it? Well, some of our guys uh, did some boo-boos out there and they wore their welcome out. They wore our welcome out. But things just kind of slipped out, slipped away. Kind of heart, heart wrenching to see this shut down. I mean, uh, and forgive me, we had a lot of hard work involved in this facility here. To tell you the truth, you know, I never, I never imagined when we were out working on the tools that I would end up serving as uh, the international president. Uh, well, and I, but I also never imagined I'd be the one having to close my own home local. That's it. Yep. What is the red ass anyway? Um, you'll probably never hear it uh, labeled that in the New England Journal of Medicine, but I'll tell you what, I've had it. Um, I've seen it. It can, r it, it can run rapid through a job site. It might start out in the ductwork with three or four guys, and the next thing you know, it's spread to a crew of 75 to 100 guys worse than the stomach flu. Uh, there goes morale, there goes productivity. Um, now, the red ash, you know, we even used to have a little saying. Uh, you'd see it in soapstone on the iron. You'd see it in uh, the uh, house walls. Uh, if I can remember it, and I'll try to clean it up a little bit. My ass is red and my pockets are green. So screw XYZ and their generating machine. There was actually a cure for it as well. As Kyle Evanson would say, the only cure for the red ass is road dust. I started in 1972-73, Arizona, not known as a union hotbed. We did all of the work. There was no non-union contractors in Arizona. If it was a smelter, a tank, a boiler, whether it was a new job or a repair, it was no question we were going to be on it. The only question was whose logo is going to be on the check. We had it all. We left jobs on a perfectly perfect day because it was, oh, we ain't working in this rainstorm. If there wasn't a good reason to wobble or walk off a job or threaten it, then we manufacture one. The biggest one I know of is Page, Arizona, three 800 megawatt supercritical CE units. And we literally had members that went around and 
through apple cores, dust masks, and various other types of trash in all the water cans. And then our foreman just came up to us and said, hey, grab your lunch boxes, hit the gate, boys. We're walking. Why? I don't know. But they'll tell you down at the bar. We ended up with a picket line out on the street and literally 800 craftsmen stopped from work. Uh, our GF ended up getting beat up right there on the gate. And we ended up use, doing those units one more year, and that was it. We worked there every year through May, from January to May, 1981. Last year, we did any boiler maintenance in there. And there's no one considered staying. There's no one that said, oh, this isn't the right thing to do. We grabbed our lunchbox without question and left. And that's what you had to do back then, or you would have never been able to work with these guys again. In 1984, Brown and Root moved into the Inland Orange Paper Mill in Orange, Texas. First big non-union job ever done that I know of in our area. And so we put a picket line up. I uh, wouldn't call it a, a wildcat strike or a wobble, but an actual picket line to protest them doing that work. All crafts were involved. Um, hundreds of people on this picket line in the morning time. And in, the, in that day and time, they had quite a bit of clout uh, with the local officials, the judges, and what have you. And in fact, the sheriff at that time ran his deputies off, all law enforcement away, actually made the highway patrol leave, and told us, you know, you got to, we're going to be back here at 7.30, and I don't want to see anything, what's going on. So we had made these star balls, you know, ground these welding rods to real sharp points and weld them together, and hundreds of them. And we scattered them all out through the driveway. So we thought that was all cool, you know, everybody had a flat. And we hindered them from going to work and we stopped them. And needless to say, Brown and Root finished that job. And when I became business manager in 02, I thought I was gonna do what every good business manager should do and I was gonna to go to every facility in my area and market and get us back into these facilities and tell them all what we have to offer. And I ended up at Inland Orange and I'm talking to the plant manager and I'm thinking it's going well. I'm selling the Boilermakers and I think he's really listening and he's doing well. And 30 minutes into the conversation, he spins his chair around and he goes over to a file cabinet there, pulls out the bottom drawer and pulls up one of them star ball. He said, you know what that is? I said, unfortunately, I do. He said, do you know where it come from? I said, I can assume 1984. He said, you're exactly right. He said, we picked up hundreds of them with magnets, and we picked up hundreds of them in our tires. He said, this one came out of my tire. He said, I hadn't been working here at that time for three years. But he said, I keep that for no matter how bad it gets, I never, ever want to relive what I saw in 1984. He said, I got an outage going right now that I'm seven days behind on. But he said, you know what? When I pull up here in the morning, I know I don't have to put up with any lyricacy. We had it all everywhere. In Arizona, like I said, there's no hotbed for unionism. We were plan A. There was no plan B. We thought it was gonna be that way forever. We thought we thought they couldn't, they couldn't survive without the Boilermakers. Well, you know, we drove the owners to be where they're at now and, and uh, we were wrong. With the, some of the crazy stunts we pulled, we made them look for plan B. You can't see the future. You can't see what you're doing today, how that's going to affect 20 years down the road. That was uh, 30 years ago. Yeah. 30 years ago, and today, we have that same owner refusing to hire Boilermakers on a $500 million gas fractionation site. You know, history has painted a picture of re reacting and getting angry and wobbling and uh, uh, screaming and yelling gets you results and it's, it's not like that. We need to learn how to respond instead of react. About four o'clock one morning, I got a phone call that uh, was going to have a picket line at Kingston Steam Plant. Well, Ed and all of us know no pick with TVA product. So I drive up there and I asked the guy, I said, what's the problem? He said, the, the Boilermakers drove a forklift. He said, now Vince, I know you're a Boilermaker, but you're going to have to support us on it. There's about a hundred Boilermakers standing out there. Yeah. 
So I go over there and, and I said, hey, I need to address the boilermakers. They had enough respect for me. I got to address the boilermakers and the iron workers and the fitters and everything else. I said, do you know why you're out here on the picket line? Well, they got a picket line up. You don't supposed to cross a picket line. They've got it up because we drove a forklift. You know, we're going to work. Who's going in first? Just get behind that car right there. Went up there and there was the operator. You know, he said, Vince, I thought I knowed you better. I said, you know, we're pretty good. Get out of the damn way. We're going to work. You know, the guys were out there trying to do the right thing and they really didn't know what the right thing was. We've told some good stories about what the red ass is, looked at the high cost for owners and contractors. Now, let's take a look at what it has cost you. Plain and simple, it's cost you money. Over 50 million. That's about how many man hours all the boilermakers in the US and Canada worked back in 1979. The number of man hours worked each year has gotten smaller over time. Oh, some years are better than others, but overall, that's fewer jobs going to boilermakers. That's fewer hours working, fewer dollars earned. Every year, less and less. Here's another number. 20 million, 20 million man hours worked. That's what passes for a good year today. We can break the numbers down and look at them any way you want, year to year, by section. See where the numbers occasionally go up and where they go back down. But any way you look at it, fewer hours mean less opportunity for you to earn a living and provide for your family. Less in your wallet today, less in your pension tomorrow. And one more interesting thing about the red ass. All these stories we've heard, all these numbers we've seen shrink, all the ways we've seen it weaken our union and damage our reputation, that's all in the past. The future, that's up to you. Keep her smiling, y'all. Well, this being the uh, first class, I guess this morning when I woke up, I really wasn't sure what to expect because I was raised as a boilermaker believing you're supposed to fight and hold back and hold your ground and all these old things. But, you know, I just haven't seen that get us anywhere. What President Jones wanted was a code of excellence for the boilermakers but not one that just resided on a piece of paper hung on the wall. But he wanted something that would reside in the hearts and souls of our boilermakers to get inside of us. I think the future of the boilermakers could rely heavily on what we talked about today. It gives you more insight into what the contractor has to deal with from his side of the fence. We look at it from one side of the fence, but we don't always get to see it from the contractor's side of the fence. Walking in, I honestly felt it was just going to be another class that I was just going to have to complete. But walking out, I see that there is a lot of meaningful information to this and, and there is a, a good way to carry ourselves on a job that not only us as apprentices should learn, but all of us should do. And uh, every boilermaker should respect the creed and understand that. This is what we need to start doing every day, the, the code. This is not just the bottom of the pile kind of a thing you look at. This is front line and center. This is this is a lot of thought, a lot of effort, a lot of time put in putting into it. Knowledge is power. And if you take a little bit from every single class we got, you're powerful. It's truly a great day for local 69 and for all boilermakers. It's a start and a in a small step to a large solution. I really believe we're going to take care of business now. If we can make everybody think this way and I believe we can. These guys, the young guys, have a future. And, uh, and I might just hang around a little bit longer. Our Boilermaker legacy started over 130 years ago. It's been earned with sweat, blood, and determination. That's how we've endured. As part of this elite organization, you now carry the load. To do it right, 
You must live our code. Pay attention. Brotherhood. Everything we are begins with our bond. Opportunity to earn a living, to work a trade, and to create our own destiny. Integrity. When a Boilermaker makes a promise, consider that promise kept. Leadership. Leaders solve problems. We solve the hardest problems. Excellence. A job done right the first time. Responsible. We are the partners that owners and contractors depend on, always striving to do the right thing for the right reasons. Mentor, living the Boilermaker code and creed to show the next generation how it's done. Accountable, stepping up when others are stepping back and being accountable for our actions. Knowledge, craftsmanship is infinite. A Boilermaker is always improving. Exceptional, finishing the jobs. Others are afraid to begin. Respect for our fellow Boilermakers, our contractors, our customers, and their property. Because on a job site, we are guests standing shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters. Safe. Because not only is safety one of our competitive advantages, but also because none of it matters if we don't go home at the end of the day. History has also proven what doesn't work. Things that folks don't forget. Things that can last for decades. Our code may sound simple, but it will only work if you live it every day. Follow it and you will build our collective future. You'll prove worthy of being a part of an elite organization. You'll prove worthy of being a Boilermaker. In the military, uh, everything's you know based off of structure and and uh, you know creeds and and code of conduct and, and the way you present yourself. Um, there's a lot of parallels between this program and the way I was raised in the military. I spent 10 years active service, six of those in special operations, and I can tell you that something has to guide the new generation from passing the torch from the old ways to the new ways. And I think this program is is absolutely what's needed to kind of give that guiding direction to us new guys who are coming in. And I believe that it won't only make you a better bowler maker, I think it'll make you a better person if you follow these principles. So, you know, this is something that, you know, this should be the standard moving forward and, and you can't go backwards. We cannot go backwards. I am a bowler maker. I am a skilled craftsperson and a member of a team. I serve my family, my family, my crew, my local, my union, and my employer. I serve a brotherhood whose exceptional legacy spans over 130 years. I honor those who came before me, my mentors. I honor their struggle to provide me with a union opportunity. I respect their knowledge, their knowledge, leadership, and integrity. I will show up on time, ready to work. I will give quality work for quality pay. I will I'll honor the negotiated contract and let my stewards and union representatives do their jobs. I will be responsible, will be responsible and accountable for my actions. I will do it right the first time. I am an excellent problem solver. I am a I guest. I guest at job sites and conduct myself accordingly. I am constantly learning and sharing that knowledge. I am always working safely and demand the same from those around me. I am a guardian of craftsmanship and a union way of life. I am part of a brotherhood. I am a Boilermaker. I am a Boilermaker. Live the code. <laughs>